Hi, everyone. Hi, Hello. good morning. I think Neha, we should start in a minute here. Yeah? Sure, Amraj. Thanks. I think we should start now. All right. Yeah. 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 Sure. Sure. All right. A very good morning and good afternoon to you all joining us from different time zones. I am Neha from Impact Investors Council India, and it's my pleasure to have you join us for a very exciting knowledge series we commence today. A mm -hmm. um, few quick housekeeping checks before we begin, please. Um, just to let you know, this meeting is being recorded. Um, I would kindly request you all to put yourselves on mute apart from the speaker, please. And um, if I could also request you to keep your settings on speaker view as opposed to gallery for easier visibility, that would be great. All right, then. So we are pleased to share that India Impact Investors Council is partnering with Artha Impact's platform called Impact for Breakfast Club. It's a gathering of people from EU family offices, foundations, funds, venture philanthropy, focused on enhancing learning and collaboration amongst peers on different areas in impact investing. As a part of this Impact for Breakfast initiative, Impact Investors Council from India is coming out with a series of virtual knowledge sessions focused on unearthing and showcasing innovative impact investing opportunities emerging from India. The very first chapter, as you can see, of the series targets unlocking climate resilience in the global south through tech-based innovations. Um, quickly giving you a background, as you may know, the Impact for Breakfast platform run by Artha Impact currently has 25 city chapters across the globe with 3,500 members. Artha Impact, an ISC member, is an investing arm of Rianta Capital, which is a dedicated advisory and office to the Singh Family Trust in Europe. Meanwhile, India's Impact Investors Council is a member-based industry body supported by around 60 members displayed on the screen right now. Our objective is to help build the impact investing ecosystem present a compelling and comprehensive India impact story and strengthen impact investing in India. Moving on, a quick glance at your day ahead today. As you can see on your screens, um, there will be a quick introduction by Audrey Selian, the director of Artha Impact. The opening remarks are by Ram Pai, the CEO of Impact Investors Council. Um, there will be a keynote by Anjali Bansal, the founding partner of Havana Capital and Sustainability Fund and board member Gift City IFSCA. It will be followed by two very smashing discussions. The first one is a fireside discussion with innovative climate tech entrepreneurs from India and uh, followed by an interactive roundtable discussion on building scalable pathways for disruptive tech-based innovations and climate resilience. Indeed, a very exciting 90 minutes ahead of us. I would also like to take a moment and thank the Artha team, Alex and Debbie, for your support in bringing all this together. Thank you very much. And with that thought, who better to kickstart the day with but Audrey Selian, Director, Artha Impact. 
sorry, yeah, Audrey has been active in impact investing since 2007 and has been a wannabe techie since 1997. She completed her PhD in technology policy and uh, development and has been thinking about how to intervene the two ever since. She is passionate about bringing good people together and pro proving that investment in good businesses is one of the keys to best serving the underserved on this planet. Audrey, over to you. Thank you uh, so much, Neha, for such a, an illustrious introduction. Uh, it's wonderful to be here. Welcome to all of you. Uh, this is a, a very special session of Impact for Breakfast because we finally get to work together with the IIC team uh, which, um, and we're, it's a member, it's a network which we are very proud members of and which we have been looking forward to collaborating with um, on such a series for um, quite some time. There's uh, a great deal of synergy between all of our organizations and the IFB, the Impact for Breakfast uh, space that we create is really one for informal exchange. This is an opportunity for all of us to, to listen and learn and interact uh, the goal here is uh, not to create a, a, a one-way broadcast model, but to really interact and 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 connect and and build lasting friendships and 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 uh, partnerships and collaborations uh, that serve our our collective missions. So very excited about today and about our speakers. I will just say the one thing that um, today I think we have about fifty people on the line. And uh, we're all going to be listening to uh, our incredible innovators and thought leaders. Uh, please know that this, as was mentioned, this session is being recorded. Um, if there are others who you know who should be here who aren't and who would benefit from the opportunity to engage with any of our speakers, any of the companies, the key is really to um, kind of generate the network effects as much as possible in an explicit way. So I'd encourage you to think about who you might want to share this with, who uh, who else should be part of IIC, who may not already be. Uh, it's really about that um, that that outreach and that and that mode of thinking. So, uh, without further ado, I just would like to um, yeah thank you all again for being here, and uh, happy to pass the baton over to Ramraj. Great, thank, thank you, you very uh, much, Audrey. Uh, sorry, I'll quickly introduce you, Ramraj, uh, before you come on the screen. Um, very much, Audrey, with this passion, support from Alpha Impact India um, hopes to India hopes to spread knowledge and build stronger network. I now take immense pleasure in calling upon the captain of my ship, the CEO of Impact Investors Council, Mr. Ramraj Pai. Ramraj has been a credit market specialist with specialization in financial services and inclusion related issues. Before joining ISC, Ramraj served as the president at Crystal Limited, which is an Indian analytical company providing ratings, research and risk and policy advisory services in a subsidiary and is a subsidiary of uh, American company S&P Global. During his 24 years at Crystal, Ramraj led uh, them to set up integrated business development functions across businesses focused on relationship management, deepening product penetration into banks, financial institution, covering India and emerging markets. Over to you, Ramraj. Uh, thank you, uh, Neha, uh, for the introduction and very good morning and uh, good afternoon to everyone on the call. This is Ramraj. I am the CEO of the India Impact Investors Council. Um, you know, thank you all for being here, and uh, thanks a lot to Artha Impact, Audrey, Alex, and Debbie for this opportunity for us to be here presenting this first series of or the first in the series of sessions on what we loosely call as the India Impact Investment Showcase. Uh, you know, before I begin, um, you know, let me talk a little bit about two things. One, what the IIC is. Neha has already mentioned it, but nevertheless, let me take a minute to tell you a bit about the IIC. And the second is also to tell you a little bit about what the rationale for the India Impact Showcase is. So the IIC, as Neha mentioned, the India Impact Investors Council is a not-for-profit industry body. And our job is really to build a narrative for the Indian impact investing market and see how we can help investors bring more capital to the Indian impact sector, whether it is foreign capital or international investors, or it is domestic investors. In one line, that is really the mandate of 
what the IIC organization is all about. Uh, the India Impact Investment Showcase, the goal of this entire agenda is really to, to, to if I may say, provide a broader narrative about impact investing in the Indian context. The historical narrative about India and investing in the country, particularly on the social impact side, has been focused on financial inclusion and has been focused on microfinance. How over the last, if I may say, six to seven years, while financial inclusion and MFI's uh, you know, investment continues, we are seeing rapid new investment opportunities emerge in a variety of areas. And these areas could be agriculture, this could be education, these could be livelihood, these could be health tech. In a variety of new areas, we are seeing new opportunities come up, new startups uh, emerge. And therefore, we felt it is important for us to create a platform like this, which essentially enables us to tell the story, not merely from the financial inclusion and MFI perspective, but also provide a variety of investors like you a broader sense or a, you know, showcase to you a broader canvas of what new areas are emerging. And we thought, uh, what better to do than to begin with climate for two or three reasons. The first is really that as we all know, and I don't want to you know, keep repeating the same thing, that this is, this is a very critical agenda, not just for, uh, from an investment perspective, it is a critical agenda from a, from a global perspective, supporting initiatives in the climate is, is, is critical and important and something that has to be done here and now. So that's really the broader uh, you know, kind of uh, you know, space in which we are doing this. But also, in general, investments in climate have by and large, uh, you know, sort of, if I may say, been, been kind of relegated to, and not that it is not important, but relegated to large scale institutional finance of traditional renewable type assets or investments into large scale institutional, uh, you know, uh, EVs, uh, you know, or mobility related investments. But what we are seeing is that the opportunities to invest in the climate space in India in innovative new technologies are coming up in areas far beyond the institutional renewable or the EV space. And we thought that it's important for us uh, as, 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 a, as a, a group of people at the IIC to be able to showcase to you, to be able to bring together people who are engaged in this space and give you all a little bit of a flavor as to what are the kind of opportunities, what are the kind of organizations, what are the kind of fund managers, what kind of work is happening here. And that's really the context of today's session. Uh, this is the first of a series of sessions. Maybe in the next session, we will take up another sector and showcase some companies and some other fund managers there. But essentially, the whole idea today is to be able to provide all of you a little bit of a flavor of what are some of those new areas, particularly in the climate space, that are seeing uh, radical new solutions, um, you know, new entrepreneurs and, and new spaces opening up. So that's the larger context of what, uh, you know, we are going to do. Um, Neha has already given you a broad context of, uh, you know, what this session flow is like. So what I'd like to do is really, uh, you know, start off things by uh, inviting um, Anjali Bansal uh, to, to come in and, and, and give us the keynote and not just give us the keynote, uh, what Anjali has also, uh, you know, been very kind uh, to do is, is really pr provide, um, you know, uh, in the next few minutes, uh, you know, a, a broader macro perspective of what opportunities uh, are coming up uh, really from a, from a 50,000 feet view. And we felt that that would be a great way for us to kick off uh, the discussions and deliberations for today. So, uh, you know, uh, what I'd like to do is just take the next minute to quickly introduce Anjali and then I'll hand it over uh, to her. So Anjali is really, uh, you know, uh, one of the leading climate tech investors in the country. She is the founder of the Awana Climate and Sustainability Fund, India's pioneering climate tech fund, which is investing in startups who are catalyzing climate action and sustainability. She's been an investor in companies for quite a while and has investments in leading companies in the country like Delivery, Urban Company, Nika. Anjali has also been uh, formerly the global partner at TPG PE, 
uh, was at McKinsey and Co. Uh, the chairman of Dana Bank, Bank of Baroda, one of the leading uh, banks in the country. She also today serves on the boards of Tata Power, Nestle India, and Gift City. She's been also repeatedly listed as one of the most powerful women in Indian business by Fortune India. Uh, Anjali, we welcome you to throw light on the climate tech space and opportunities in India. And with that broad introduction, over to you, Anjali. Ramraj, Neha, IIC, and very importantly, Artha Impact, thank you very much for the opportunity to be with this very important, interesting group today. I think uh, big change happens when the right people get behind it. And climate is something we probably should have started working on 20 years ago, but the world has started to focus on it now. So now is good. Um, I welcome this opportunity to share some thoughts around uh, the big climate tech opportunity that we are seeing, not just in India, but also for the world. So I'm going to request my colleague, Riddhi, who's going to run a few slides. And uh, I have about 10 minutes broadly, but can speed up, slow down. We'll keep it interactive. It's a small group and would love to get any commentary back from the group as well. So thank you. And thank you, Ramraj, for the very kind introduction. So as we talk about the India climate tech opportunity, I'll keep trying to put it in the context of the world as well. But I know this group has a particular interest in India. So why? is climate tech interesting and what does it really mean? So we take the COP framework as laid out in both 23 and 26, and then of course 27 talked a lot about green financing. On the path to net zero, typically three filters are applied, mitigation, adaptation, and resilience. In some ways, the global north or the developed world largely is talking about mitigation. So reducing emissions, limiting global warming, and all of that is super important. So getting to clean energy, zero emission, limiting, uh, carbon in the uh, in, in the atmosphere, sequestration, capture, putting it deep into the ground, all of that is mitigation. A lot of science and a lot of large investment going in. The second piece is adaptation. So in some ways, for those of us in developing countries, rapidly developing countries, the global south, so to speak, adaptation and resilience are very, very important. Probably the here and now is about adaptation and resilience. Responding and adjusting to climate impact creating the kind of transition mechanisms for our economy and our society, creating the next set of skills, and particularly adaptation or transition financing. Resilience becomes important for vulnerable populations. You know, if you take in India, you will see what is happening in Pakistan with the floods. Uh, we are seeing dramatic deforestation and uh, the air issues as well as the livelihood issues that are being faced in both Indonesia and the Amazon. So all of that is climate proofing economic and social systems. So mitigation, adaptation, resilience. Uh, we'll talk about this throughout the discussion because these are the areas where we need the right kind of founders creating the right kind of technology and innovation, whether it's product technology, product innovation or process innovation to solve for this. So why is this such an interesting and important and potentially valuable investment opportunity. So we know why this is important for the world, right? It's to save the planet. But whenever you have a population scale problem of that nature, you also have a big opportunity for investment. And here is why this is such an interesting investment opportunity, not just a mission statement, but an investment opportunity. It's because for those of us who have been around for a long time, sustainability feels like the next big mega trend. Sustainability is the next digital. We have seen where the world was 25 years ago, where digitization was not embedded across the enterprise. It used to be a small technical function. Most companies didn't have a CTO. Today, you don't even have a digital vertical, right? Digitalization is embedded across the enterprise. Same thing will need to happen for sustainability in every element of the enterprise. So product development, R&D, supply chain, manufacturing, go-to market, even how you deploy CapEx. Hence, sustainability is the next digital. We are seeing in India, particularly since we are talking about India, we are now the largest population in the world. 18, 20% of the global population, 60, 70% of our energy is still met by fossil fuels. India will continue to grow. And we have our, uh, if you will, our Panchabrita framework that the Honorable Prime Minister laid out at COP26. Uh, we have our net zero targets for uh, 2070, but more importantly, we have a $30 trillion economy aspirational target over the next 25 years. So even if we get to the 5 trillion economy in the next four to five years, we will continue to grow at seven to 9% GDP growth. 
Hence, consume more steel, more cement, more power. All of these are hard to abate industries. So that's the big problem statement. So why is it interesting? Because India probably has the best technology pool of talent, and we'll come to that in a minute. We've got a history of leapfrogging. We have leapfrogged twice before. We've done gone from fixed line dial up to the lowest cost digital data network in the world today. We have 700 million smartphone users in India, close to a billion people in formal bank accounts. And we have also leapfrogged from a cash economy using UPI to now a completely seamless, frictionless, costless payment economy that is digital in nature, completely democratized. Our next leapfrog that is coming through is something called ONDC, which I won't discuss today, but the open network for digital commerce is digitizing commerce the way UPI digitized payments. So why is India particular? So this is why it's a very exciting investment space because large businesses will get built. Why is India very exciting today? Because we see a confluence of some very important forces at work. The Indian consumer has become sensitized. However, the Indian consumer and frankly, even the global consumer is not yet willing to pay more for sustainable products. So this puts the right kind of healthy pressure on enterprises to step up their game on creating sustainable alternatives for their consumers. We have a fair amount of capital coming in, but we need even more capital. We have an extremely conducive policy regime. So India has significant political consensus around the need for climate action. We do not have climate denial here today, a vibrant opposition in our political ecosystem, but on climate, there seems to be a lot of consensus. Uh, every year, we are seeing more and more policy support. We have seen PLI for solar. We are seeing the EV mission. Um, we've got a national renewables mission that is coming through on 500 gigawatts of non-fossil fuel energy capacity to be created by 2030, 50% of fleet on street to be electric by 2030 as well. Uh, so the government's doing its bit. Capital is doing its bit. We need more capital, of course. Very importantly, we are seeing the confluence of cost-effective technologies. India is a price-sensitive market. It hence drives frugal tech. And those kind of affordable, low-cost technologies that are applicable in India can also solve for the world. And finally, and most importantly, is our incredible startup ecosystem. We are the third largest ecosystem in the world. We have an incredible talent pool and the quality of entrepreneurs. And I know the next session you're going to hear from some of them. You know, Ajayta, for example, has built something phenomenal with Frontier Markets, and I know she'll talk about it. So hence, India, why India, why now? Great talent pool, phenomenal technology and digital infrastructure that's got built, conducive policy regime, consumers that are willing to change and a large consumption pool, and capital that is coming in in a trickle, we need to flood in to really capture this opportunity. So what do we do at Avana? Where are the sectors and opportunity areas that we are seeing? Uh, across climate tech, we have seen a lot of increased activity over the last couple of years, really. It was relatively new. India needs about $10 trillion in climate finance to to reach a net zero target by 2070. Now, whether it's 2070, 2050, 2075, I think that's not the debate. The debate, the real point here is a lot of capital is required. Fortunately, we are seeing an acceleration in both entrepreneurial activity. So Avana sees 200 investment opportunities every quarter, 800 investment opportunities every year, phenomenal founder quality. And as this graph shows you, uh, climate startups raised more funding in the first half of 2022 than they did in the previous four years cumulatively. So there is an increase in activity. A lot more needs to happen. India is still deploying only about 1.5% of total VC capital into climate. Globally, that is about 15%. And now, importantly, we are also moving not just from the utility scale, solar, the renewable energy, the large scale sort of project finance type opportunities to early stage technology. And we'll come to that in a minute. Uh, so if we move to the next slide, we'll, uh, we'll share with you how we see the opportunity set at Avana. Uh, we invest in pre-series A, series A. So the important thing is that in market ready solutions that are ready for commercialization, we want to build the next set of climate unicorns coming out of India, solving for the world. And hence, they have to be not just sort of passion projects, but really able to create large scale commercial enterprises that are market ready. Three 
sectoral areas that are important, energy transition and resources. So that includes land, air, water, waste, but largely energy transition, mobility and supply chains, and sustainable agriculture and food systems. So together, these three sectors constitute about 90% of emissions. So it's a big problem area. So if you make a difference here, you'll make a difference in emissions. They're also cumulatively about 70% of the economy, and a large part of our population works in these spaces. So big market opportunity. When it's a large part of the economy, it's a big market opportunity. So big problem statement combined with big, big market opportunity, great founders, that's the opportunity. So think energy security, food security, and market linkages. We have been investing in these spaces for the last several years. We are already seeing some absolutely breakout companies emerging. Terra.do is building the world's largest global digital climate community, 100 million climate workers. Turno is creating the first scaled platform for adoption of EVs uh, by commercial vehicle operators. Uh, Iki Foods is revolutionizing how food will be grown, and I'll come to Iki in a minute. But a lot of early stage, highly innovative opportunities, again, both on product innovation, so fundamentally IP-led product creation, as well as process innovation, where in India, if you look at the supply chain space, for example, we have a very inefficient supply chain. So 14% of cost versus 8% globally. And consequently, even digitization of supply chains leads to efficiency, lower wastage, more circularity, and hence decarbonization. I'll pause here for a minute to see if any questions, else I will talk a bit more about what Iki is doing and what Turno is doing. I'll keep going. So Iki Foods, Iki is uh, two founders, uh, both IIT Bombay, they have been working with a professor from IIT Jodhpur, so very, very homegrown, indigenous, uh, patented technology in material science. So they have created a polymer-based growing chamber in which they are able to maintain a constant root environment for everyday vegetables. So their problem statement that, this, that Abhay and Amit started with was how to solve for Bharat ki sabzi, not for urban affluent upper class people, but for the average ordinary Indian. They have perfected the agronomy for four crops now. They are growing tomatoes, cucumber, eggplant, okra, and, and chilies in the desert of Rajasthan. 300% more yield per acre, 80% less water usage, minimal electricity, which they put up a few solar panels and that's enough because they don't have a greenhouse. And if you can grow tomatoes, which they are, they're growing tomatoes at eight to 10 rupees a kilo growing cost in the desert of Rajasthan, you can grow it anywhere. So for those of you who are science, into science fiction and have seen The Martian, this is what, what Matt Damon was attempting to do on Mars. They have actually done it in Kota, in Rajasthan. And now getting inbound interest from the GCC countries, because again, food security is a significant issue. And if you can grow it in the desert of Rajasthan, you can grow it in the desert of the Middle East as well. So that's Iki Foods patented growing chamber. We invested in them early last year. Patent was pending, patent got granted. They are now on the second generation growing chamber. Uh, cost comes down with every generation of technology. And uh, the goal is for them to actually create a whole different way of controlled growth environment, food production, much like what assembly line did for manufacturing. Next, I'll touch upon Turner. I'm just keeping an eye on the clock as well. Um, Turno is a Bangalore-based company, uh, experienced founders, uh, unlike Abhay and Amit, who are young, who are fresh out of college. Uh, this, these are experienced founders who have done a variety of things before, and they are creating an end-to-end -end platform that will enable, bring down the total cost of ownership for commercial small fleet op operators who are themselves micro-entrepreneurs. So this solves for both adaptation and resilience because it's livelihood related. Uh, for them to bring down the cost of ownership of an electric vehicle. They're also looking at the afterlife of the battery as well as uh, um, financial linkages to help bring down financing costs. So a variety of opportunities, and Riddhi, if we can go back to the three sectoral areas that we look at, uh, if there is interest, I can talk about other stuff. Otherwise, I will pause here. Great uh, founder talent, strong technology capability in the India market, big market as a whole, and again, solving not just for India, but for the world. I mean, Eggos is again creating the largest branded egg, again, controlled egg, so controlled nutrition. They can do fortified vitamin A, vitamin D, good for the farmer, raises the farmer income by 20 to 
with solving for everything, mitigation, adaptation, and resilience. Any other questions or comments? Otherwise, I will thank you all very much for your time and happy to share some of these perspectives. Thank you very much, Anjali. I don't think we have any questions or anybody raising hands. So thank you very much, Anjali. It's always exciting to hear from Indian leaders carving the path for climate investment in India. Thank you for the inspiration as always. Thank you very much. Um, now this brings us to the first discussion of the day. Uh, we begin with an exciting session as promised by Ramraj, a fireside discussion with up and coming Indian entrepreneurs using innovative technologies and business models to battle climate change. The session will dive into entrepreneurs journey from idea to skill. And it's my pleasure to invite the flag bearers of India, Ajayta Shah, founder and CEO of Frontier Markets, Rahul Bakare, founder Board Charger, and the moderator for the session is Nalin Agarwal, Partner Climate Collective and Founding Partner Climate Seeds Fund. Nalin, I hand it over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Nia. Um, thank you, Anjali. That was really a comprehensive overview of the global and Indian climate tech space. And um, before I start, thank, thanks to the Artha and IAC team, specifically Nia, Dipanchi, Audrey Ramraj for putting this together. Um, Really happy to be here with the with two of you, Ajayta and Rahul. Um, you both are really committed entrepreneurs in climate and have been so for a long time. In fact, I've been hearing of Ajayta's work since my previous life as a solar developer in the early 2010s. And of course, Rahul is someone I've known for several years as a great founder that we've also supported in the Climate Collective. Um, so with that, I know you both are solving really tough cross-cutting problems in climate building strong organizations that leverage technology. And I'm sure none of it has been easy, but it has been greatly rewarding, right? So with that, uh, I'd like to jump in and get perhaps starting with you, Ajayta, and then moving to Rahul. Uh, get both of you to talk a little bit about, just so everyone knows what you do, what your startup does. And I'd like you to also talk a little bit about your personal journey and what drives you or what has brought you here. So Ajayta, if I can. Yeah, request. great. Thanks so much, Nalan. And uh, again, thank you so much uh, for inviting me for the session. And again, I was just going to say I was reflecting on Anjali's presentation, which was actually very thorough and interesting because it's evolved so much, right? So, um, I mean, my journey starts 18 years ago, which um, ultimately you can understand that when you think about the transition of India, so much has happened in 18 years. Um, and so, um, you know, getting a chance to be obsessed with rural India for 18 years is fascinating. It's like watching a film that only now in the last five years is rapidly shifting even faster than it did in the first 10 years. Um, my journey started in, in, in microfinance. So I was working in the microfinance sector for about eight and a half years. Um, and really the goal was to kind of look at um, understanding that while we were giving financial services to rural women to be able to boost their income, what we what were we actually doing as an ecosystem to also further um, ensure that we're building resilience and de-risking their ability from um, giving you know paying back their loans? And what you learned really quickly when you're working in rural India back in like 2005 that um, there are massive um, other challenges, right? There's infrastructure challenges, there's reality challenges, and so I think for me, my my journey in climate started actually from access to electrification, where we understood that back then there really was either zero or unreliable electricity available to rural India. And in the context for everyone on the call, 700,000 villages in the country with over 800 million people, if you don't have access to reliable electrification, you're not gonna be able to really start your businesses, live your life or do anything viable. Um, and the alternative that uh, the families were using for even basic lighting or heating was atrocious, right? It was kerosene, it was um, chulas, right? Using like fire stove wood to really burn. So on a climate perspective, if you think about 800 million people using kerosene and things like chulas, you're actually talking about a massive contribution to carbon back in the day when we didn't understand that climate was even a problem, right? And so, you know, the alternative for us back then was not about solving a climate problem. It was actually about bringing justice 
to the forefront on how do we actually ensure that people are not suffering from bad things like kerosene and chudas, but actually getting something that could be clean that enables them to actually get access to reliable electrification and at the same time reduces the harm that frankly these bad um, alternatives were creating, right? Kerosene fires, killing children, et cetera. So started the journey with that and I saw a lot of kerosene fires. I saw a lot of children die. I saw a lot of people essentially just being unproductive in their ability to move forward, which got me very angry. And hence I then set up Frontier Markets, which essentially was supposed to be the solver of that. How might we create an access platform that legitimately gets the right solutions to people where they live? And that's really what Frontier Markets has been doing for the last now 10 years, where we started our journey with really addressing electrification as a challenge and brought in clean energy solutions. So Nellan, the reason why we all know each other is so you're right. I was the solar queen of India for a very long time, because at some point we kept saying it was about getting the right solar products, whether they were made in the evolution from made in China to made in India, to being more customized, understanding where the markets were, that's what we did. But what the evolution for me was that we did it through a gender lens. We recognized that women were actually at the center of the challenges that came to electrification or energy or consumption decisions. Actually, women are making consumption decisions in a way that we don't understand if we start thinking about this as a market perspective. So when we cracked that in 2015, by creating what we back then called Solar Sahelis, who were rural women that were essentially connecting products and services to families, it was game changing because you realize that by collecting the right data, you can customize solutions, launch the right products and actually really make a move on carbon emission. The evolution for us very quickly has been that all of this has now come onto a tech platform. So today we have women that are now using a proprietary technology solution to collect data, to understand how to better optimize a supply chain. So to Anjali's point, digitizing a supply chain, game changer. Um, when literally from, or, from lead generation to order to placement to delivery is more efficient, you're actually reducing you know, carbon emissions on deliveries and things like that. But also we went from only, not just looking at clean energy products because India's electrification has changed, to actually bring in energy efficient solutions. Again, looking at carbon wastage because 800 million people are actually big consumers and we don't understand that. And then at the same time, looking at a thesis around waste management, recycling and beyond, right? So plastics, for example, is a big area, which has been a big part of discussion around how do we reduce that? The biggest consumer of plastics actually are rural markets because of sachets. So ultimately recycling and actually getting people empowered to um, make that change is a big game changer. So today, 35,000 women entrepreneurs have helped over a million families huh? start thinking through their climate journey differently. A million oh, people that we have on our platform. Sorry, I think someone is yeah, needs someone to be is. muted. Okay. Um, so we today now have a million people on our platform that are telling us that they are ready to change their behavior if we give them incentives. Now imagine a future where you can actually find a rural women farmer, rural women farmer, because she's more ready to change faster than even men. And you give her the right organic practices of farming. Massive change when it comes to carbon emission. So I agree that there's a huge opportunity. The journey has been very interesting, but we've gone from going from electrification to clean energy yeah. to understanding that we can actually be champions of climate. Thanks. It's fascinating stuff, huh, Jetha? I mean, there's, I, I'd like to dig down deep. I'm, 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 I'm aware of time, but thanks a lot. So you've gone from microfinance, energy access, climate justice, gender lens, supply chain, and now you're creating an enabling ecosystem to kind of bring all kinds of stakeholders. Excellent stuff. Um, Rahul, if I can uh, request you as well to come in now. Yeah, sure, sure. Thanks. Thanks, Nalin, and thanks for this opportunity. Um, so basically my background, I'm a mechanical engineer. I graduated way back in 93. I went to US, I studied, I did my master's in mechanical engineering and computer science. I worked in software and uh, industry and IT industry in US and in India for more than 18 plus years. Uh, but something was amiss. Uh, I always wanted to uh, understand, you know, why farmers commit suicide. That was the, the always a thought provoke, uh, thought was getting provoked in my head all the time. 
And then uh, when I said, okay, I cannot be just on the sidelines and judge uh, based on somebody else's experience, I wanted to do my own farming and understand, you know, why farmers commit suicide. So I did farming for six years, as a matter of fact, uh, I had a pomegranate farm. Uh, and I realized that basically water is one of the biggest problem. So I decided to shift out of my corporate career. And then I, I, I joined a foundation called Azargam Foundation based out of Bangalore, which worked on drinking water and sanitation. Uh, while working at Argem, I realized that uh, water is a major issue in, all across India. And 80% of India depends on, uh, for its domestic as well as agriculture water, on groundwater. But unfortunately, there is no uh, expert, there are no, no, no professional uh, advisors or prof professionals who are giving services in groundwater sector. So I started India's first participatory groundwater management network, which uh, with which we, are, we experimented in five different different hydrogeological regimes, uh, different approaches on how to increase groundwater, how to make groundwater sustainable, how to understand groundwater. In that, we uh, build communities' capacities to basically manage their water, collect data, analyze it, visualize it, and do the uh, uh, associated implementation and planning and management on groundwater. So uh, it, was a, it was a mammoth exercise which we were able to do for five plus years. And the, the material which we were able to generate, the knowledge we were able to generate, we were able to put in planning commission. I myself was on planning commission. And through planning commission, we were able to mobilize more than 4,500 crore rupees towards groundwater management and introduction of groundwater management in different government schemes, especially the latest scheme of Atal Bhujal Yojana came from that effort. So we did a lot of work on uh, not only just doing uh, uh, implementation on ground, but also taking the learnings from there and putting back into the advocate through the advocacy channels into the policy and change the policy for the betterment of groundwater. But while doing the implementations and while doing this entire work, I realized that uh, there are no professionals who are providing this service. And that's where we had decided to uh, uh, move out of the, the for not for profit. Uh, sector, I started my uh, own uh, uh, social enterprise called as Urdhvam, in which now we have developed a patented, unique, uh, smart rainwater housing technology, which basically recharges bore wells, which are drying up very fast. As per Niti Ayog, more than 60% of the bore wells would go dry in next 10 years. And India has more than 5 crore plus uh, bore wells. So that's a tremendous market opportunity. There's a tremendous problem which people are facing. And wherever, uh, when I did the analysis of going to the ground, talking with different farmers, especially the farmers who have committed suicide, I realized that basically somewhere water and especially the borewell water is at the root cause of lack of production, productivity, and hence not getting sufficient income and then getting into the uh, uh, debt trap and hence farmers committing suicide. So decided to work on borewell as a, as a unit uh, uh, problem. And then we developed this unique patented technology called as bore charger that enhances the recharge of borewells at a very affordable cost, multifold, two to 20 times the, uh, the recharge rate of those borewells increase. And the water giving capacity goes from one to additional six months uh, per borewell and also provides better quantity and quality of water. So we have done more than uh, uh, 2,000 plus bore charger implementations. And through those, we have recharged 250 crore liters of water till now. So that's a technology what we have developed. And I'm sure uh, with, with five crore big, huge market uh, and no competition to us, as I said, there are no experts in groundwater who are providing such services. So we are developing uh, this technology further to reach the scale. Wow. Thanks, Rahul. That really impressive numbers and a very nice um, uh, segue into, into what my next question is, is when I'm sure a lot of people here would like to hear what's special about, uh, you know, um, your your innovation. Um, perhaps it's the technology layer, perhaps it's something else, perhaps it's something in the business model. Um, so it would be great to hear that. And even if you want to, I don't want you to kind of uh, sweat on it, but if there's one surprising thing that you learned as you built your organization, um, um, you want to share that, that'll be nice as well. So if you can talk about your innovation and and, and, and that as well. So Ajeta, I'll come back to you perhaps. Yeah, I think I like I like your I like your uh, last question the most. Um, I think the, the the biggest thing that I think I've learned um, in our organization is that um, 
like the, the key to make changes happen, to, to create behavior change is actually through women. I mean, it was like a big learning and it sounds really ironic because you know you would assume as a woman leader, I would have probably gone in with a gender lens from day one, but actually we didn't. We were in Rajasthan and we said the route to market was um, farmer uh, uh, retailers who were all men. And if you look at Rajasthan, you were thinking, oh, if you're going to sell big clean energy solutions, you need to go where the money is. And he thought it was with men. So actually, we were very male centric for almost, um, I think, uh, Audrey, uh, God, four years, five years. Um, and um, and then this aha moment happened when we realized that when we were doing this, um, um, what was it? It was it, it was like a customer satisfaction survey that was being done by a third party by EY. And they kept calling the phone number of the men to ask, what do you think of this product? And they had no idea how to answer it because they kind of ultimately said, my wife uses it, my daughter uses it, my mother uses it. And so we realized 70% of the users were actually women. And I think that really led to a game-changing journey for us about saying like, why would you target um, women to actually really start thinking about how to make behavior change and systems happen in a different way? Um, what is unique about, I think, our model is not our technology, it's our platform. So um, there's, I think, two unique, it's a, it's a business model, and I'll tell you the technology. The technology today is probably the first ever rural-friendly um, super app that basically helps rural women be able to be assisted uh, facilitators of services. So we have been able to integrate with all different kinds of tech companies, ed tech, ag tech, health tech, fintech, et cetera, into our app that has helped women that are digitally unsavvy, that are not necessarily literate, use the app to collect data, to connect people, and to be able to bridge that absolute last mile gap. I think that's been the big innovation. The second innovation, I think, is that we have actually understood that if you look at the ecosystem, the challenge today is not logistics necessarily. There's enough logistics players that are out there. The challenge is not necessarily product innovation because there's again, a lot of innovation of product solutions out there. Actually, the challenge is trust and demand generation, like bridging the gap for the customers to understand what the opportunity is because we're not getting a chance to understand who that woman farmer is and what is her climate pain. Right. So what's interesting for me is that 800 million people of which 100 million are women farmers, they deal with climate calamities on a regular basis. Right. When we were dealing with COVID, we were dealing with locust attacks. Right. In Rajasthan at coming into UB. So like we were dealing with like land degradation. So women are ready to take on climate resilience seeds. Right. They're ready to do organic farming. But if we don't know that, we can't bridge that gap effectively. Right. And so FM has been successful in using women to become the conduits to understand the gap between the market, which is the customer, and then the suppliers that have the solutions. Um, and we've been able to drive a business model where incentives are created in such a way that everybody gets money or saves money or becomes productive in that value chain, which I think is really critical. What we're looking forward to in terms of like the innovation is where the tech first approach, um, and if you look at the ecosystem in India, there's over 80 million women that are part of the self-help group infrastructure. If you're able to digitize that entire ecosystem, get them on a platform and let them be the voice, all of a sudden new markets open, carbon trading, right? Divesting and investing in women in an interesting way. And I think that's really what we are excited about driving in terms of our future innovation at scale. Excellent. Thanks. Thank you, Jetta. I mean, it's uh, it gets more fascinating the more you tell us about it. Um, Rahul, I think we have oh, yeah we have Rahul back. Um, yeah. So, so Rahul, just, uh, the same question to you. Yeah, I'll just talk briefly about our innovation. Um, right. That, that was a good question, right? Yes. About your innovation and perhaps anything surprising that you learned. So basically, uh, uh, as I mentioned, India has more than uh, uh, five crore bore wells, and out of that, uh, sixty to seventy percent are about to go dry completely. And bore wells typically take water from the deeper aquifer systems, which are aquifers are nothing but water sources, which are at two hundred, four hundred, six hundred feet, 
and rainwater is not able to reach up to those 200, 400, 600 feet. And we are abstracting that water, which is not today's water. It is actually old water, which is 1,000, 10,000, maybe millions of years old water we are abstracting at mindlessly. And we are the uh, world's largest groundwater consumer. And we are abstracting at such a mindless pace that basically you know, water levels in India is going down drastically. Uh, so what is required is infusion of uh, fresh water into those deeper aquifers, deeper storages, and replenish those. But because of the, uh, uh, the geological nature of the rocks and the soils and everything in between, from the surface to the 200, 400, 600 feet uh, reservoirs, uh, uh, water is uh, percolating very slowly. So an urgent need is required to basically enhance the recharge. So a technique called as artificial injection recharge is applied. And we have developed bore charger as a technology wherein we undertake in simplistic uh, terms, we undertake angiography of the bore well by putting a camera system into the bore well and understanding and studying the, uh, the bore well. And then we undertake angioplasty. So we have developed a robotic tool which uh, goes into the bore well and it perforates the bore well from inside. So it perforates the casing pipe from inside, thereby allowing the water from the topmost aquifer, which is there up to first 20, 30, 40, 50 feet, which is very saturated during the rainy season, but that water is not able to go into the bore well. So we are able to infuse anywhere between 4 lakh to 80 lakh liters of uh, recharge every year which otherwise is not going into the bore well, thereby replenishing the deeper aquifer resources and thereby increasing the duration of water supply, the quantum of water supply from that bore well, as well as improving the quality as well. Now with this additional uh, uh, supply, the farmer is able to get better production, better yield of their uh, uh, produce and better quality as well. And hence is able to increase the income anywhere between 15% to 25%. So that's the tremendous change we have been able to make into the market. We have been able to, uh, uh, I'll give you a classical case study. Uh, uh, Nabi Sahib, a farmer in, uh, in, in drought prone area of Northern, Northern Karnataka was getting water only for 15 minutes for his orchard during summer. But when we went and did the bore charger implementation in his bore well, immediately in the summer itself, his water giving capacity from 15 minutes increased to six hours. And his income rose threefold because of better mango production he was able to take and better quality of production as well. So this is a classical example of that. Uh, this is this technology is not only applied for farmers uh, who are who are getting uh, less income, but it's also applied for women and especially for women who have to uh, walk far away distances to get water. I'll give you a classical example in tribal belts of uh, Thane districts in Maharashtra. Uh, hand pumps were not working for in certain hamlets and women have to walk almost four to five kilometers to fetch water from a nearby open well. Uh, right. What we did, we did bore charger implementation on that hand pump and the hand pump which used to go dry in the month of January started giving water till May and they don't have to now walk those far away distances and uh, risk their life of getting into that uh, open well and fetching the water. That's a tremendous amount of impact we have been able to make. And we have done more than 2000 plus such bore charger implementations and recharge 250 crore liters of water uh, potentially in those wells as well. Excellent, uh, Raul, thank you. I mean, I think, um, it really illustrates uh, very well how a climate focus uh, business really also is able to um, address, uh, you know, uh, women who are really much more often disproportionately uh, more vulnerable to the effects of climate change, you know, so that was a very nice example of that. Um, and uh, I guess uh, what you're doing is, is, is quite incredible in terms of accelerating what is an otherwise slow geological process of percolation and groundwater recharge. So uh, really good stuff. Uh, and only can be done with kind of uh, a technology to enable that. Um, great. Uh, I'm, I'm aware we're moving close to the end of uh, time. There are three more topics that I'd like to cover. And I'll let you, uh, I'll, I'll tell you the um, next two together. So if you want to club them, that's fine. But one is I want to understand from both of you the market opportunities that you see in the space. We have a lot of people here from India, but also from Europe and North America. So it'll be interesting for everyone to know what the market opportunities for you as a startup are. You can also go beyond uh, adjacent sectors and, and generally talk about general market opportunities the way you see them. Um, so that's one. 
Uh, and then a little more back, kind of focusing on your startup. What were the challenges that you faced in scaling in your home market? How you address them? And you can talk a little bit about what your specific needs are as you go, go forward, right? Uh, I'm happy if you club them uh, in the interest of time, but otherwise take them one at a time. So we'll start with opportunities. Yeah, awesome. Um, and I'm just going to say, I might have to just rush off right at three, like in like three minutes. So I hope that like, right. if that's okay. okay that let's, let's right? Yeah, ahead. okay. Okay. Um, um, so, okay. So market opportunities. Um, I think that if we're looking at the carbon trading space and we look at where consumption is in rural India, there's huge carbon emission opportunities that we can actually save. So I, you know, I think this is why the South South is so important because even though we don't, this is like create the carbon, we can actually reduce it even further where the consumption is happening on a behavior change perspective. The simple examples that I can give you, circular economy in terms of recycling and waste management, um, I think huge in terms of looking at farming. I absolutely agree about the idea of organic farming and actually bringing that in. And I think the third is that um, solar has been kind of like in between the spaces, but if you create an economies of scale, i.e., a platform for like 100 million people, we will bring solar appliances back in a very serious way, which actually, again, could be a very interesting space, especially as you're thinking about solar cooling, you're thinking about solar heating, and you're also thinking about productive appliances. And then again, where the market players lie in terms of carbon trading. It's a huge revenue opportunity. And I think this is where the European, our European investors that are there, like, I'm sure you're eyeing all of this because that's how it's unfolding. Um, challenges, I think, honestly, is that I think that there's a need for more blended capital. Um, at the end of the day, like they're, you know, getting our, um, having the ability to build the infrastructure, build the foundation, and then actually activate the revenue opportunities takes time. Right. And I think that ultimately sure. the role that I think grants and venture debt, long-term patient capital debt can play would be game changing because then you're opening a platform for markets to come in and real revenue to unfold. And I think that's probably sure. where we did not get that kind of access early on when we were setting up. Um, I, and that's probably why it took us longer to kind of get where we are because there are calamities in rural India. And it's just a reality of what we've been facing yeah. from like demonetization to COVID to whatnot. Luckily, yeah. we've been able to pivot and respond but I think there's, again, I'll switch it back into the idea that there's an opportunity because I think India can be a masterful place to be like the epicenter of climate um, um, uh, opportunities. And I would say this, especially because we're thinking about Africa and we're thinking about Southeast Asia, where we're thinking about the populations are not urban, but they're actually primarily yeah. rural. And this is a big way for us to become a templatized solution for the world. Excellent. I'm gonna, right. I'm are so you, sorry, you, I have to rush okay. off, but yes? <laughs> sure. All right, okay, all right. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, thanks, Sujit. Thanks, Ajayta, thank you. Yeah, so, Rahul, so if I can come to you, yeah. Yeah, right. just quickly, basically, the market, market opportunity is humongous. Uh, as I mentioned, there are more than 5,000 crore bore wells. Every year, around 20 lakhs are getting added to it. The new bore wells are uh, being drilled. Uh, so the it's an ever growing market. Eighty percent of that is in hard rock, where both charger technology is applicable. So overall, in terms of total available market, is around anywhere between forty thousand crore to uh, sixty thousand crores as such. And both charges the technology which can easily fit into any government scheme in a subsidized way, uh, and and government can provide subsidy for for it to get scale. So that is one part of it. The challenges, uh, what what I would suggest uh, say is that basically uh, groundwater is a very nascent field in India. Uh, there are not too many uh, players, not too many experts. India doesn't produce hydrogeologists as a matter of fact. It's an irony, but that's a challenge what we are also facing in terms of hiring of good talent. But yes, nonetheless, through uh, 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 training of the, the, the local rural youth, we can develop them into para hydrogeologists. So we already have developed a franchising model of bore yes. charger which can basically be used for scaling up and skilling of the local rural youth at the same time, uh, uh, reaching the different parts of India in a short span of time. So that's already been developed. That's a challenge. Uh, how do we scale up? Because the problem is humongous. The problem is coming fast and furious at us. We have to uh, take it head on. If you have to take it head on, we have to have a decentralized and a scalable model. And that's what we have been able to do. Uh, 
um, and groundwater uh, uh, is is actually it, it it's a it's a resource which is there for our future generation, but we are robbing them uh, of that resource. So uh, uh, it's everybody's duty to basically recharge, replenish, and groundwater. Because if it's hai, then hai. Nice, excellent. Also, I liked the idea of training. I think you use the word para hydro hydrologist, but whatever I mean, whatever the word was, it was it was and the concept is right. We have to we have, we have to upskill people and get them into the formal workforce for sure. Um, great. Absolutely. So last question, Rahul. We have another two minutes, but correct, Neha? Yes. We have time for the last. Okay. All right. So a little bit of a speculative question, but also gives everyone a sense of your vision. Yeah. Yeah. Just tell us how you see your company evolving over the next ten years, and what success looks like for you as 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 one of the pioneering pioneering water recharge companies in India. So actually, uh, we started as a groundwater services company, and we realized that okay, services being uh, human dependent, uh, uh, it's not easy to scale up. So that's where we got into development of products. So bore charges is the first product what we have developed. We are in a in the process of uh, uh, developing other products and productized services as well, such as groundwater scanning, aquifer mapping, uh, as well as uh, uh, groundwater training, because as I mentioned, groundwater training itself, uh, th there is no curriculum on groundwater. So there is a tremendous amount of upskilling uh, market, which is there, especially in groundwater. The idea is that we develop these uh, para professionals through our training tools, technologies, uh, and the data what we are actually collecting. So actually in the next five years, we would like to become a groundwater data company because there is no data on groundwater which is available in India. And through our work in different parts of India, if we're able to capture data on groundwater levels, groundwater quality, groundwater, uh, different aquifer systems, and if we are able to develop a, uh, an atlas of groundwater reservoirs in India, I think that would be a tremendous uh, opportunity in my opinion. So we'd be moving from services to products to uh, 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 data and platforms, and we would be able to provide these uh, uh, services to insurance companies, to governments, to industries, to even farmer collectives on uh, availability of groundwater and recharge uh, uh, solutions in their region, thereby improving the sustainability of groundwater. So in next five years, we see ourselves as a groundwater uh, 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 advisory, groundwater uh, uh, data company. And based on that data, uh, we would like to take that, convert that as a boilerplate and in Africa is next tomorrow's India, right? So we would like to also take it to Africa and maybe to the southeastern uh, countries as well. So that's our vision to become a groundwater sustainability technology and products company, uh, which will leverage IT, IoT, robotics, and technology. All right, that sounds excellent. Raul, thank you uh, for, for sharing uh, your experiences and your insights. Um, I think we've come to the end of the session. So, Neha, I'm going to hand it back to you. Thanks. Thank thanks. you. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Thank you, Nalin. Thank you, Rahul. And a big thank you to Ajayka, who's had to move, um, uh, leave early. But um, uh, thank you, all of us, uh, all of you. Innovation and India evidently are hand in glove. And I'm certain we all go back enriched. Uh, Nalin, thank you for your fantastic moderation. Uh, there is... Uh, a, a definite impact on ground, and that's the biggest takeaway. Uh, um, without wasting any time for the voices and experiences of uh, India's leading climate, climate focused asset managers, the panel hopes to shine light on the overall market opportunity and innovation trends across key areas in the climate and at investing in some of through climate related innovations and put a QA session at the end of this panel. So please feel free to share your questions. We can make it as interactive as possible. Now let me get out of your way and before um, I mean uh, by introducing the panelist. Uh, we are today joined by uh, Disha Gandhi at our capital. Kunal Upadhyay, co-founder CIIE. Um, Karthik Chandrasekhar, I'm uh, not sure if he'll be able to join, but nevertheless, the session. And last but not the least, our moderator for the day, 
A. Priya Shah, General Partner, CR Ventures. Um, Priya, I hand it over to you. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much, Neha. And I thank think Karthik to... is here as well. Okay, great. Hi, uh, Karthik. Sorry, Karthik. Sorry. Um, no worries. Uh, thank you so much to the IIC team and also to Arthur Impact uh, for hosting us here today for the Impact for Breakfast and good morning to everyone and good afternoon if you're based in India. Um, it's great to be here. I'm uh, looking forward to moderating this panel uh, with our various uh, fund managers from different climate tech funds actively looking at the space in India, deploying capital and um, looking forward to discussing some interesting thematic areas. Um, so now um, just wanted to, I know you've heard a lot from previous panels, uh, speakers, um, you know, investors as well as um, innovators. So we'll keep this session, um, you know, as sort of uh, structured and relevant as possible. Um, and we'll try to wrap up um, shortly because I know we're running behind on time. So uh, Neha, if I can just request you to um, show two of our slides. Um, I know that it's just uh, an additional yes. subsector overview. Um, great. Yeah, so, Okay, wonderful. Um, so just very quickly before we start and before I introduce the panelists, I um, wanted to mention, um, you know, you've obviously heard the macro overview um, from uh, Havana Capital and also the, the sort of um, on the ground innovations uh, from our two uh, entrepreneurs. Uh, but just to recap, um, you know, the predominant sectors within India um, in climate tech are currently renewable energy and electric mobility. And that's where the uh, vast majority of the capital is going into, and especially in early stage venture. Um, in 2021, and 7 billion was raised by Indian climate tech startups, um, largely towards these two sectors. Um, but uh, over the next few years, there are several new sectors that will come up across, across um, various different um, sort of sub-segments sub and also importantly across um, climate mitigation, climate resilience and climate adaptation. Um, so the Indian climate tech market needs a capital infusion of over $1 trillion by 2030 across multiple different areas as mentioned. Um, if we can move to the next um, slide, um, that uh, this this essentially the slide gives you um, an idea. Uh, Neha, if, if it's possible to move to the next slide. Great. Um, this slide gives you an idea of some of these um, new sectors that are emerging um, that will form a large part of the um, climate tech venture ecosystem and where the capital is going um, in about seven years time, so by 2030 or so. And so we've seen clean mobility, transportation, clean energy generation, so essentially supported by regulation, um, supportive Indian regulations, such as um, you know, the launch of real-time energy markets, green term ahead markets, also open green access rules to integrate re renewables into the grid, um, carbon markets um, and carbon tech. Um, so essentially um, supported again by the National Carbon Markets Framework, which will be launched at the announcement of the budget next week, and also the business responsibility and social responsibility uh, regulations for the top um, 200 companies in India to measure their carbon emissions. Um, in addition to that, there's several technologies like hydrogen, where we're supported by a national hydrogen mission um, that's really built up a huge amount of um, monetary support for, for large industry and smaller companies working on electrolyzers and various different types of other um, you know, extraction um, of uh, hydrogen from water as an alternative um, to chemical burners. And then there's also, you know, the green buildings, um, food agriculture, um, huge sector within India, given that India is largely an agrarian economy, um, a lot of innovation there to reduce um, the carbon impact uh, of fertilizers, pesticides, um, you know, supply chain uh, on the ground and um, work towards more sustainable food systems. Um, and then lastly, of circular economy. Uh, so plastics, recycling, this was covered in the previous panel as well. So this is just gives you a snapshot of of some of the really interesting innovations that are taking place um, right now in India. I think, um, you know, we've heard from previous panelists that India is um, really, really sort of um, fortunate to have an existing venture ecosystem, um, huge amount of talented founders, um, climate supported regulation, and also concentration in early stage capital coming in. Um, at the moment, you know, um, I would say that adaptation, climate adaptation um, is, and climate resilience look like to be more kind of asset light models and climate mitigation are more asset heavy models. So sort of carbon capture and some of these larger investment areas, but we can cover that more in the session. So without further ado, um, we can stop presenting the slides, um, Neha. And um, just wanted to have a, uh, give a quick introduction to the panelists. So we have uh, Disha from Avishkar, one of India's oldest and largest impact funds. Um, Kanal from CIA, CIIE, an incubator within the Indian Institute of Management in Ahmedabad. And uh, Karthik from um, 
from Suncom Ventures, which is a climate tech fund. So welcome to everyone. Um, and just wanted to kick us off with a, a question, um, you know, to all the panelists. So, um, you know, given that climate tech is a large and emerging opportunity in India and capturing the attention of more commercial invest investors, what are some of the most promising subsectors where you think that India will leapfrog other countries or where we have a natural advantage? So solar, biofuel, sustainable food, agriculture, and these can be examples within climate resilience or within climate mitigation or climate adaptation, whichever um, sectors that you would like to draw from. Um, would love to direct this first question to Kunal if, um, if you'd like to answer and take this forward. Thank you. Thank you so much, Priya. I mean, of course, uh, climate is a phenomenally large opportunity as it stands today in the Indian context. Uh, quite a few large industries that are going to get disrupted with, with the uh, entire decarbonization theme that we've been talking about. So significant opportunities that are going to pop open in the climate mitigation space. Uh, and to name a few, I mean, we've seen the journey of uh, companies like Fourth Partner, which has been one of our portfolio companies and was one of the early movers in the renewable energy space uh, from being a very small seed investment that we made in the company, say, six or seven years back. The company is now in the process of raising close to an $800 million round. And within a short span of time, five to six years, uh, a space like uh, solar energy as a service has emerged as a big space. Uh, we've talked about uh, EV. EV definitely is a huge opportunity again. Uh, we are seeing massive opportunities emerging in areas like energy efficiency uh, and broadly beyond energy efficiency, I would call it out as a utility as a service. Uh, and again, wanting to highlight a very important nuance as exists in the Indian and to a large uh, uh, extent, I would say applies to global south as well, um, applies equally to places like China. Uh, there are very few uh, end customer who would be willing to actually buy a technology. Uh, the customer would expect a full stack solution to be provided. And many of these mitigation technologies that we are talking about will actually require the entrepreneur to create a full solution, which is uh, the word that I would use and love to use is called servitization. It will require the entrepreneurs to actually servitize their technology, whether it takes the form of a hydrogen as a service or whether it takes the form of air quality as a service or heating as a service, cooling as a service. It will require Indian entrepreneurs to actually convert these technologies that they may be creating. Many of these technologies may actually be existing technologies, more efficient technologies, uh, well proven, well beyond the TRL 789 uh, available in the global context, but the right business model needs to be created in the Indian context and rolled out. Uh, and a massive climate mitigation opportunity is gonna require our entrepreneurs to actually think like a full stack operator and not think like a point technology provider. And if they are able to prove these solutions in the Indian context, it'll be very easy for them to roll it out in the global context. Uh, so gave you some examples of the climate mitigation piece. On the resilience side, again, large opportunity. I mean, all said and done, India has the world's highest social cost of carbon. Uh, 21 out of the top 30 most polluted cities are here in India. I mean, an estimated million plus people die because of uh, air pollution. So a lot of opportunities that exist in the pollution monitoring uh, as well as pollution control space. So we back companies like Oizom, we back companies like Strata Enviro, which again have a big uh, impact on uh, overcoming uh, the pollution related issues. The other piece is heat wave. I mean, health risk that climate change imposes uh, is again a big, big impact that the country is gonna face. And therefore there is a requirement for us to make the most vulnerable people that we've got more resilient. Uh, and we backed companies like, uh, and I mean, I just highlight the recent World Bank report, which talks about the need to roll out a trillion dollar plus uh, green cooling to actually overcome the impact of heat waves, et cetera. So we backed companies like Smart Jewels, which are uh, providing uh, cooling as a service. We backed companies like Tesol in the past, which is doing a lot of work in uh, green supply chains, uh, creating cold chain. Uh, 
there's also going to be a big requirement for coming up with new uh, new solutions to overcome the vector borne diseases that are going to pick up again just to make our uh, kind of most vulnerable population more resilient so i mean we backed uh, technologies uh, for example a company called stratify care which is creating a diagnostic test to uh, figure out the intensity of dengue uh, opportunities like those i mean Um, I think, uh, Kunal, we may have lost you uh, in case you're trying to reconnect. But um, while we wait for Kunal to come back, thank you um, so much, Kunal, for your comments. Very insightful sort of uh, overview on um, the various different technologies and examples from their portfolio on um, what sort of upcoming where India can Indian technologists can really build and scale up uh, for global adaptation. Um, so over to you, Disha, would, would love to hear from you as well, um, maybe taking some examples from Avishkar's portfolio because you've been investing in clean energy and across agriculture sustainable food for such a long time. So any sort of particular, um, you know, uh, sort of success stories that you would like to highlight or any areas that you see a huge future in and where your companies in particular could scale up globally and, um, you know, leapfrog others in the global context. Oh. Thanks. Uh, uh, I think, uh, you know, from, from Avishka's perspective, the way we understood the challenges that climate would pose and the opportunities that could have been created by addressing those challenges has that thought process has evolved. We've been sort of in this ecosystem for the last 20 years and uh, we've, we've ourselves sort of come from and being an early stage investor to being a more pre-series A, series A. Um, investor and we've seen the evolution in some of these sectors and we've seen the newer opportunities that can that are being created as sunrise sectors uh, within the overall climate theme as well. Some of the uh, companies that we've backed in this space uh, which fall under the theme of climate for us is uh, a company called NEPRA which is in the waste management space uh, uh, addressing the uh, hazards of, uh, of mishandling of plastic waste and uh, the building a sustainable model of uh, creating an organized supply chain for handling, collecting, sorting, segregating of uh, plastics and other dry waste materials, and sort of being the single um, responsible supplier as the ecosystem evolves around recycling and technologies around that as well. So I think, uh, you know, we, we continue to see this as a very large opportunity today. A player like Nepra is just a drop in the ocean. India generates about 65 million uh, uh, tons of waste annually. And, you know, Nepra's combined capacity across all the four locations that they operate in currently is, is, is less than a percent of, uh, of what the market opportunity is. So this is across, uh, and this thesis extends across all different types of waste as well. And as newer sectors emerge, we see the kind of waste that gets accumulated also evolve and the composition of your dustbin waste also changes. We're seeing a very large opportunity in the battery recycling space now given the impetus in the Evo, uh, EV ecosystem. And um, what is also sort of encouraging to see is that the rate at which technology and R&D ad adaptation is being done in the country today. And we've been in touch with some of the large universities and educational institutes, technical institutes across the country. Almost everybody runs an incubator and an accelerator program. Um, investors, which are on this panel and otherwise in the Indian ecosystem, also have been very and have been very supporting of uh, uh, sort of boosting some sort of initial capital into these spaces. And you know, that is where the entire innovation landscape uh, emerging, uh, emerges from you know, today. And apart from this, I think for a, for a country like India, which, which is gonna face a dual challenge of, you know, apart from sort of the climate uh, risks, uh, also in terms of resource uh, efficiency, because we are going to be dealing with a large today, India is already the most populous country in the world, and you know that burden is going to keep increasing. So all sectors that are at an intersection of climate and uh, resource efficiency would would continue to see a good interest traction and demand um, from commercial capital at least, and that's the way we sort of look at it. 
Great. Thank you so much, Tisha. That was um, really substantial, very well uh, summarized um, and exciting to hear about the traction of some of your companies. Um, so over to you, Karthik. Um, would love to hear your thoughts um, being having uh, incubated companies over the last six, seven years, um, seeing them grow um, and scale up. Uh, would love to know from you, you know, what are some of the natural advantages that we have in India to build for climate? Um, and also some examples from your portfolio that are doing this and also working in other countries as well. Uh, continue to attract yeah. commercial capital. Sure. Um, thank you, Priya. And uh, thanks uh, to IAC and Artha for having me here. Uh, and I think, you know, when we talk about India, I think the important thing is to understand the diversity that we are dealing with uh, in terms of people, in terms of nature. Um, so for us, I think the biggest uh, value we see uh, with you could say leapfrog, you could say uh, potentially having a, just a very different vision for the future um, is uh, looking at more distributed solutions, right? I think uh, especially when it comes to say mitigation, uh, the biggest opportunity out there is basically right now electrification and shifting to renewables, right? And all of the uh, actions that go alongside uh, need to be kind of built on. But I think one of the biggest parts and opportunities we see in India on the mitigation side is seeing more rapid distributed uh, electrification happen uh, within India, right? And uh, and I think change is coming, it's gradual, but I think the technology and the capabilities are now there in the Indian market to look for more distributed uh, renewable energy-based electrification happening in India. And those are, the, those are the opportunities we really kind of look forward to supporting uh, on the mitigation side. Um, quite a bit, obviously, is in terms of investors looking at India, a massive opportunity is on the efficiency side, whether it's on the uh, energy efficiency side or the resource efficiency side. And uh, and for us, when we think about resource efficiency, we're thinking in terms of uh, long-term resilience, uh, in terms of like key resources or key materials that, that we need to keep um, so that uh, we don't have to extract more. And India as a country doesn't have too much uh, access to natural resources. So naturally we need to kind of uh, be smarter at like all the things that we recycle. So, so when we think about recycling and circular economy, uh, we spend more time thinking about critical natural resources uh, rather than kind of so more about the plastics and other things, right? So kind of looking at the important resources that we need to recycle. Um, and, and then the last bit, I think, and the most important bit when it comes to India is uh, quite a bit of the work that we've been doing more around learning uh, on what we want to do on the agrarian sector, right? And, uh, and land use. And uh, we've been spending the last uh, about three years uh, working with uh, the World Resources Institute on a program called the Land Accelerator. And, uh, and that, uh, along with a lot of the programming we've done and small seed investments, uh, we have done in land uh, restoration entrepreneurs, in uh, startups that are working on trying to figure out how do we kind of spend more time being in harmony with nature, again, comes back to uh, what I would say, distributed solutions and community-supported agriculture-based solutions. So uh, rather than going towards more efficient uh, technology-driven supply chains, uh, looking for opportunities where you can use technology, but kind of do also place-based uh, investments. So, so is there an opportunity for us to do more uh, to preserve local biodiversity, to preserve uh, how we use uh, land, how we are... Uh, uh, kind of improve our relationship to the farmers. And we are now starting to see opportunities emerge from all the work that we have done. We are starting um, to invest more in adaptation-based technologies. Uh, so a great example is a company that we are looking at, uh, which is using uh, tissue culture uh, to preserve local heirloom crops. And it's a very different, so it's high technology, but also a very different approach to building a business, uh, which is driven by preserving local biodiversity, right? And I think, so there's going to be an evolution of uh, what kind of technology uh, you want to support, uh, which mm -hmm. basically adds to that vision of the future, but also kind of how it's applied with business models where you can actually uh, see scale happen 
Uh, mm -hmm. but with a very localized context to different regions in India. And hopefully we can use that to export that concepts uh, beyond India to the global platforms. Uh, so really excited about what, what we are seeing in the adaptation. And I think uh, you can look forward to some of the other work that we will see with WRI as well, as we are uh, building out something called Land Restoration uh, Fund, uh, which is focused on trying to build what land restoration would look like for middle India. So looking at Maharashtra, Madhya Pradesh, uh, where we want to do kind of uh, investments uh, that align with what the government is doing locally, what the uh, local and nonprofits are doing uh, within those ecosystem on land restoration and kind of bringing in uh, entrepreneurs and technology to kind of uh, see what long term land restoration would look like over a period of like five to 10 years. Uh, Great. So thank you. Thanks. Thank you so much, Karthik. That was a um, really interesting um, sort of analysis of the holistic approach uh, to climate innovation on, and on a rural level, obviously, and then looking at various different stakeholders who can collaborate um, to kind of build that ecosystem. So thanks for sharing those examples. Um, I'm also keeping an eye on the clock. So I just wanted to make sure that, um, you know, we can sort of run over just by a few minutes. I just have one last question to the panelists. And then if there are any audience questions, we can open up. Um, so my final question as a panelist is, is you know, around Around, and we sort of touched on this is around the risks of investing in climate tech. Um, so, you know, unlike, um, you know, other venture sectors, um, climate tech is sort of a little bit more acid heavy. Um, there's a lot of hardware, there's a lot of middleware technology. Um, there's also a huge concentration, as mentioned earlier, in the early stage um, in terms of capital. So what is the availability of late stage capital? What's the ab ability for these companies to create a blueprint for scale? Um, what's the sort of quality and robustness of the tech, especially the deep tech? And then are there any talent gaps, um, you know, that we're lacking in India, what's needed to sort of fuel the ecosystem? So, or what do investors generally see as, as some of these risks? Um, so once again, I just um, would love to direct the first question to Kunal, and um, then we can uh, sort of go in the same sequence as before, before we close. Thank you. So again, thanks Priya, at least, and sorry if I, uh, if my voice begins to crack again or I drop off, uh, pardon for that, but uh, at least on the mitigation side, I feel that increasingly there is a very clear playbook that exists. Uh, I mean, India has produced uh, and globally solar has been the trailblazer, if you may, uh, when it comes to creating the right models for scaling up decarbonization technologies. Uh, I feel uh, this, uh, a similar playbook needs to be played out. Uh, and I mean, I take pride in the work that fourth partner, one of our portfolio company had done, uh, wherein if you are able to uh, create a good product market fit, which we've seen in the context of solar, I mean, uh, through a company that, uh, Karthik and I have co-invested in called Smart Jewels. We are seeing it in energy efficiency. Uh, if you are able to create a good product market fit uh, by creating a full stack servitization solution, there are enough pools of green capital which are available on the debt side, uh, which is you take it the Tata clean tech capitals of the world, you take the current uh, asset securitization platforms that exist on the EV side, people who are willing to give you uh, low cost debt ranging anywhere between 6% to 12, 13%, uh, which is what many of these projects require. And I mean, whether it is hydrogen as a service, whether it is EV as a service, whether it is energy efficiency, whether it is wastewater as a service, many of these solutions require, I mean, these are asset heavy. Uh, I, I don't want to uh, claim that these are asset light models that every VC ought to be backing, but these are Think of them as early private equity worth investments, uh, which will produce a potentially a 50% IRR for you. Uh, it may not produce a 200% IRR because these are asset linked uh, investments, uh, but a very, very, very strong interest that exists from later stage private equity investors. And again, I mean, a case in point that I would make is for a fourth partner wherein we'd put in a million dollar the next round of investment that came about was actually a 70 million dollar with a tpg rise coming in. Uh, i mean the point that i'm wanting to highlight is the jump uh, from a million dollar investment from a pre-series a investment to what in the vc world will get seen as a series b or a series c investment can happen within a very very short span of time from uh, large private equity investors who are wanting to actually create these asset books. Uh, 
uh, the role for us as early stage investors is to identify them, get them to a product market fit stage, and then subsequently uh, bring in some debt capital. And at the back of this debt, uh, I'm very confident that larger equity investment very will very, very easily flow in. So that's the kind of um, opportunities that exist across mitigation space, uh, which is the, the asset intensive part of the uh, climate story. The asset light, which is the climate resilience piece, uh, is actually very close to what any VC would want to do, including uh, a lot of, uh, uh, let's say, risk platforms, uh, insurance platforms, financial inclusion platforms. Many of these are health uh, platforms. Many of these are regular VC investments. Uh, if there is merit in an innovation, uh, which is reaching out to the masses, I'm pretty sure all... Um, all different kind of uh, regular VC investors would be willing to invest in the space. So definite pools of money that have existed traditionally, but a lot more capital flowing into the mitigation space as we speak. And it, it's something for us to leverage and build companies of consequence from India. Great. Thank you so much, Kanal. Very insightful and um, great to shine that spotlight on blended capital and the need for additional forms of asset classes to actually help fund uh, the hardware uh, pieces and the other sort of sections within climate um, and the opportunity for larger PE funds to come in too. So it's encouraging to know that those exist. Um, and how about you, Disha? How, what have you sort of perceived as you evaluate these climate tech businesses? Any of the risks that come to light um, when you're, you know, sort of pulling these companies through your investment? committee, uh, any sort of um, red flags, et cetera, that you've looked at or anything that has been overcome by your portfolio companies? Well, I think there are, there are two sort of perspectives on this uh, that, that I have, right? One is from the experience of our journey with our own university companies in the climate space and two sort of broad themes over there, based as I earlier mentioned, and even sustainable agriculture, right? And we've taken a few bets in that space too. Um, and the other is the uh, deployments that we are looking at making in the climate sector from here on, and what are the emerging spaces over there. So the risks have been sort of slightly different across both these. And of course, it's a matter of the scale, the maturity of the subsector within the climate theme, and it, it plays out in that way. I think uh, I, I sort of agree to the point that Kunal uh, said that as, as an investor, I think the key challenge is to get the company as an early sort of check writer. The, the challenge is to get the company to a product market fit. And that's where we've seen some of our earliest investments uh, in the climate space uh, sort of take a longer time as well. And this goes to the fact that it is crucial to analyze the, uh, the sort of investment opportunity from the perspective of which market you are catering to. Are you a macro model or are you a micro market model? And if that is going to be the situation, the micro market models may require a far more patient journey from an investor lens because you will need to keep sort of tweaking and iterating as you keep expanding uh, geographically or as you keep adding more clusters, right? And uh, same as the experience with our own agri companies as well. We've invested in some of the very large agri tech companies uh, that exist in the country today, AgroStar. Uh, we've invested in a very innovative model around grain bank called Urkos. Uh, we've uh, invested in um, horticulture uh, company as well, um, called I and I farms and uh, and few more, right? And over there again, we've been the early sort of investor over there and innovation takes time in complex markets to prove. So that is sort of one risk that uh, investors, depending on which stage you are entering at may face. I think for us as investors from here on, uh, it may be perceived as you know, policy is sort of, a, a lot of sectors are hinged on the policy movement and the direction over there. I think personally, I take uh, the entire role of policy in the climate space today as a huge boost. 
uh, contrary to what you know may be perceived as a support or a necessary support but i see that as a huge boost so any you know these are some of the sort of uh, challenges or the three sort of um, points that we look at when we sort of go in at uh, evaluating investment Great, thank you so much, Disha. Um, and Kartika, finally over to you. Um, you know, would you agree with some of the the comments made already about product market fit, technology, and time to scale? And are there any other potential risks that you've also seen in investing in some of these companies uh, at this particular time? How do you think it might change in the future? Yeah, you know, and I think uh, thanks, Brian. Absolutely agree with both uh, what Disha said as well as uh, Kunal and. I think you bring them all <laughs> perfectly uh, summarized together. Uh, and I think, um, especially what Disha was talking about in terms of micro markets and kind of trying to figure it out because India is a pretty diverse country. So if you want to have solutions, even just for across India, you got to like go back to the drawing table multiple times as you evolve the business uh, for scale. Um, I think one thing that everybody repeated, right, is product market fit. And I think uh, historically clean tech has had that problem where you want to kind of, um, you know, have technologies and technologists kind of building out solutions without a customer in front of them. And I think uh, what's, you know, hopefully uh, changed <laughs> from all the learnings over like multiple uh, booms and busts is that VCs now, really are thinking about that idea of product market fit. Is there a customer in front of you? Are you getting the feedback? Uh, are you getting customer delight before you kind of are uh, looking for the startups to scale? So I think having that customer focus is a very critical aspect. Uh, the other bit that we see as a, as a big uh, thing that you want to kind of fix for and thing something that, you know, uh, Vivek at Fourth Partner or Arjun at Smart Tools are doing well, uh, right? As uh, as organizations kind of setting themselves up for scale, is team uh, company fit, right? You need to evolve your teams as you're moving from like the startup product market fit phase to preparing for scale, right? You need to kind of start thinking about what kind of business are you, uh, what kind of capabilities do you need to have in your team as you start scaling up. Uh, a clean tech firm, uh, especially if you're going to be in an asset uh, heavy or uh, asset linked business, you really want to kind of think about what's the what are the what are the type of people you want on the finance side, what are the type kind of people you want on the operational side, because execution and finance becomes a very critical aspect of it, right? So maybe learning from the P peers and kind of building those businesses, right, are going to be extremely important for both the early stage VCs, but also for the startups, uh, which really don't want to get diluted by the time they get to growth capital, right? And so we've seen a lot of that happen in the past. And I think if you're smarter and building better businesses uh, from the ground up, but also kind of evolving them as they also evolve uh, with scale, I think that's a massive opportunity to not repeat the mistakes of the past. Mm -hmm. And so... So I think each, as the startups evolve with scale, I think making sure that they have the right uh, team talent uh, in place is going to be extremely critical to manage those risks. Yeah, no, absolutely. Thank you so much, Karthik. That, um, yeah, a huge, a very important factor to consider um, when making these assessments into these early stage companies, particularly across climate tech space. Um, so I think that was all the questions that I had. Um, I think we've noticed in the chat that there aren't any additional questions from the audience. So once again, just wanted to thank our panelists for very kindly spending the time discussing all of these thematic areas, answering all the questions and sharing your perspectives. Um, and over to you, Neha. Hi, thank you, Priya. And thank you very much, uh, all the panelists, for an enriching discussion and shining the light on some of the key innovations and investment themes and climate adaptation. I'm certain we all we feel very well informed and updated on all the climate action coming from startups in India, which is why we are here. Um, so, ladies and gentlemen, we now come to the closing of the evening. It has uh, indeed been a great pleasure from all of us here at ISE and Artha Impact uh, to have brought this session together for all of you. Thanks once again for joining and watch the space for the next chapter of ISE Artha series. 
uh, opportunities, research, uh, insights, or any dimensions of impact investing market in India. Have a great week ahead, all of you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Thanks. Thanks.